Good morning. Well, we started a series last week called The Prince of Peace, and so we began to talk and unpack that a little bit. And in fact, if you were with me last week or saw me online uh, during the week, you saw me dragging luggage around with a chain around me and dragging it. And at the first service, it actually worked out really well. The luggage started falling over, and it got heavier and heavier and heavier. That didn't happen at the second service. But the point is that if we keep our baggage, that's what happens in our life, right? It gets heavier and heavier and heavier as we go through life. And the idea is, We've got to deal with it. And so that's what we talked about last week of of how to deal with our baggage. So if you didn't uh, participate in service or see it during the week, I encourage you, check check it out online and and just see what happened there. Because I'm telling you right now, if you want peace in your life right now, then you've got to make peace with the baggage of the past. There is no way you can make peace today unless you deal with that, unpack it. And that's what we talked about last week, how to unpack that baggage. So I just encourage you with that. But I want to move on this week a little bit and and talk about another aspect of peace with God. And it's more about the here and now that we have to deal with, all right? And so uh, with that in mind, we need to redefine or remind ourselves about what peace is. Sometimes we think peace is, you know, the uh, lack of war or the lack of strife that's going on in the world. Well, I've got news for you. Jesus said that wars and rumors of wars are going to happen till the end. So you can pray your little heart out. Uh, The reality of it is Jesus himself said the world is not going to be at peace. Why? Because they're not at peace with him. But here's the thing. You and I are in a different place than those people in the world. We have the opportunity to know the Prince of Peace in a personal way and to walk with an inner peace that's different from the world's kind of peace. And so what's that definition? Uh, it actually means peace, the peace that the Bible talks about is to be at oneness with yourself as well as with God. And that means that you haven't got that turmoil going on on the inside. You know, when you have an idle mind, what happens is sometimes then, then you have all that strife. Now, you know how some of us, including me at times, deal with uh, lack of peace in our lives? We distract ourselves with devices, with all the television, you know, with all the different things. And so what happens is it's a way to kind of drown out the anxiety and the strife that's going on. Let me tell you something. That's not a long-term answer. I believe that there is a long-term answer, and it's found only in the Lord Jesus. Amen? And so, with that definition in mind, uh, I think of uh, a little, we have a little girl in our congregation. In fact, she's here today. The smallest of the little girls. In fact, she's only about two and a half months old now, Bailey is. And so, I get to see little Bailey pretty often, because Pastor Aaron, you know, our, our children's pastor, is in, you know, one of our staff, paid staff, and she's at the office. And, and Bailey gets to come and visit every now and then. So, she's there sometimes, and it's so cool, I get to come up, well, it's so cool for a lot of things. She's not my problem. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's a cool thing, right? But it's still really nice to visit, right? And so, it's, it's they have the little cradle thing set up in her office, so I go in, and there she is sleeping peacefully. There's nothing like looking at a sleeping baby. There's just something about why they haven't got any baggage. They just started out life, right? There's no baggage whatsoever. They're just peacefully sleeping. They ha- they're not having bad dreams about anything. Nothing has happened that's bad in their lives, so they're just peacefully sleeping. But here's the thing. I've seen another side of Bailey. Sometimes she's not any more that sleeping little angel. She's got a pair of lungs on her. And, and so there are times where, where she's screaming her little guts out, you know, rah, you know. And, and so Erin, being the good mom she is, is trying to do all the stuff, right? Okay, diaper check. Is that okay? Uh, okay, is she hungry? Check. Uh, no, she's not hungry. Okay, you know, she got gas. And so, so sometimes I'll, I'll be in my office and I hear this beating going on. I'm like, my God, she, she's really trying to beat that burp out of her. But, you know, sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. You know, and so often we don't know really what the problem is, Right? But here's the thing, Bailey, though she has no baggage, you know, nothing in her past to cause her pain, right at that moment, there's some kind of input, whether it's a tummy ache, you know, gas, whatever, that's causing her to cry out, to be suffering. And the same is for us, you know, sometimes it's not baggage from our past, it's just some of the inputs of life, different things that are happening, area of relationships or finances or whatever's going on, it's an input and it's causing us to cry, maybe not as loudly as Bailey, but to cry on the inside and to have lack of peace because of it. Because what is is the opposite of peace? It's anxiety, 
it's strife, it's, it's manifested through right, lack of sleep, health issues, you know, the list goes on and on. And so here's the thing. What's the answer to this? And I believe the Word of God talks about this. In fact, it talks a lot about it. I want to go back. When we started the service last week, I read an opening scripture. I want to go back to that. We're going to go in a little different direction with it. Have a look at this. It's John 16, 33. And Jesus is speaking, and he says this. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart I have overcome the world. That was our starting scripture, and, and we emphasized the part that, you know, you're going to have some difficulties at times, but Jesus is with you. But I underlined another part today, and that's what I want to focus on, and we're going to move on. Jesus says this, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. Now, I was taught in Bible school to always ask questions, the who, what, where, why, when, you know, all of those as you're looking at scripture. So you know what pops out at me? What things? He says, I've told you these things that you can have peace. Well, what things? Well, here's the beauty of it. He tells us these things through the chapter before, in chapter 15 and 16. He literally says this thing, then he says that thing, and then this thing over here. So literally, I want to focus this morning on three things that he t tells us that we can have his peace. Anybody, would you like to go in that direction? Yeah, it's, it's right there. You know, that's what I love about God's word. The answers are here. In fact, scripture says this in, in I believe it's in 1 Peter, that everything that we need for life and for godliness is found in him. It's all there. Everything. Every question you've got, there's an answer in the scriptures. Any, any hurt you've got, there's help in the scriptures. There's an answer in the scriptures. You just got to go find it. And so let's find out what these things are that brings the peace of Jesus into our lives, all right? Okay, so here's the first one. John 15, verse 11. And he, he literally says, they're going to put it up. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. So I'll just have a look here. These things. So there's the first thing that he brings up. And he says, look at, I want my joy to remain in you and your joy to be full. So whose joy is it that it has to start with? His. It says, my, Jesus is speaking. So my joy. Well, okay. So if we begin to research the word, there's a scripture in Hebrews uh, chapter 12, verse 2, and it says this, that for the joy set before Jesus, he endured the cross, scorning its shame. Well, okay, I don't know about you, but when was the last time you hit your finger with a hammer and said, oh, joy? <laughs> I don't think any of us, right? No, we said, oh, something else probably, and then, and then repented, right, for the next 10 minutes. Because that's just the reality of it, right? You, you know, and so here's Jesus is going to go to the cross. And here's the thing. He knows everything. So it's not like you and I going into a circumstance and maybe believing for the best in it, think it's not going to be too bad. He knew how much it was going to hurt. He knew how many lashes were going to happen. He knew that that crown was going to be pounded into his head and those thorns were going to go in, literally into his brain. He knew that he was going to suffer and be humiliated on the cross. He knew all the details before he even went. And yet it says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. So here's the catch. So often we don't think the bigger picture. He didn't have joy in the suffering. He was having joy in what that would produce. Have a look around. Take a look around right now. It was you and I. In other words, for the joy of you and I. In other words, coming into a relationship with him, he endured that suffering so that we could come back into a relationship with him. And so that's where it begins. Just put that scripture back up for a minute, all right? And so as, as we see this, just look at it. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you. In other words, our joy comes from his joy. And what is that? The relationship that we have with him. That's where it begins. In fact, that's where it begins and that's where it ends. If you want peace in your life, then strengthen your relationship with him. Because then regardless of whatever's going on in your life, you're like, I've got Jesus. I know eternity is set. I know that everything's going to be fine in the by and by. I also know that Jesus is walking with me right now, that whatever I'm going through at this very moment, Jesus is with me. I am not alone. Now, when you get to that place of believing that and actually acknowledging that, that Jesus is with you through everything, you're not going to have any anxiety, not to the level you've got it now, because Jesus is holding your hand. In fact, the word says that if you grab hold of him, he'll grab hold of you. And let me tell you something. Jesus is a hugger. 
He'll never let you go. You know what I'm saying? He will never let you go. He is there for you. And so it begins with joy. Okay, what's the next thing that he does? The, so he's got some other things he's got to say, all right? So here's the next one. John 15, verses 16 and 17. Again, the Lord is speaking. Jesus is speaking. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. That whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. These things, there it is again, I command you that you love one another. This is a really interesting scripture. First of all, he's talking about fruit, but let's leave that just for a moment and jump down to the bottom. Verse 17. These things I command you that you love one another. Those are strong words. He's not saying, hey guys, you know, I, I just want you to try to love your neighbor. I, I want you to try to love, you know, your, your family. I want you to even love those who persecute and those, those who try to hurt you. He's not suggesting it, is he? He says, I command you. That's pretty strong, isn't it? You know, especially, you know, the Lord that, that we know and we talk about, it's like, well, you know, he doesn't force you to do anything. You know, you have power, choice, right? But he's saying here, he's saying, look it, you do this. There's no options with this. So here's the problem I've got then. If God is commanding me to do something, that means I, I may not have the ability in myself to do it. But he's commanding me. So that means that somehow... He gives me the ability to do it. This, this is really, really important because if you're trying to love others out of your own kind of love, you're, you're going to fail. But if you're loving others with the love that we've been commanded to love others with, and by the way, this word love here is agape. That means no strings attached, not expecting anything back, but you're just demonstrating caring and loving for the other person above your own needs. Now, that's a pretty long definition but that is the reality of it and here's the thing you and I don't have that inside of us apart from Jesus we don't have it and I remember Sandra and I in the early years you know we're a pretty happy couple now you know we were laughing on the way down from the car she was messing with my brain and I was messing back and we we're just laughing at each other but the thing is 30 years ago we weren't the happy couple that you know now and in fact I remember one day after uh, she was Anyway, it was bad. It was bad. We're not going to get into the story, right? We're not, I'm, we're, I'm not going to digress, all right? But it was a bad situation. And I remember walking out. I lived on a farm at the time, walking out of the field, screaming at God, saying, God, why did you give me this woman? And I'm, I'm nitpicking everything that she's done wrong. And, and God then spoke to me. and said, Sonny, are you done? And I started screaming even more until I had no more air in my lungs. And finally then God could speak because I was done talking because I couldn't talk anymore. And you know what he told me to do? He said, you're the one talking to me now, so you're the one that I want to impart to. I'll talk to your wife when I talk to her. That's, that's my business with her. But here's what I command you to do. I want you to love her. And I'll tell you something. With everything within me, as tears were coming down my cheeks, is no, I'm not going to do that. But my spirit was screaming, yes, you are going to do it. And that was a turnaround in our marriage. Now, I loved my wife before that. If you understand what I mean, it didn't that I hated her or anything, but it was just struggle and striving and, and just, just two different cultural backgrounds kind of and just different ways of thinking. And it just, it was bad. And all of a sudden I realized I have to put all that aside and I need to love her as Jesus loves me unconditionally. I don't know whether you've looked in the mirror lately, but we're all quite a mess. I'm just, I'm just saying. And he has chosen to love us unconditionally. So he's not telling us to do something he's not doing already. He's loving us just the way he's commanded us to love others. And in fact, if we're not doing well at that, let me tell you something, and this may, may poke some people, means that you aren't fully experiencing God's love in your own life. I'm just being real with you. But let me tell you something. God wants you to experience his love. And so I invite you right at this very moment just right where you're seated, is to say, Lord, you know, I, I struggle loving other people. Then that means, Lord, that I'm not experiencing the fullness of your love and your forgiveness and your grace and your mercy. Just ask him right now to open your heart to receive from him because you can only give out what you've got. And so as you experience his love in a new dimension, it will change the way you see 
and love others. So I just encourage you with that. So pop that scripture back up again. I want you to look back now at something. They're going to put it up. There it is. Okay. Uh, It says, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and what? What's it say? Bear fruit. What the heck? What are we, fruit trees now? Like, uh, what what, what is this? But here's the thing. There there is an amazing truth here. This fruit, I love, okay, first of all, let me say this. I love how Scripture supports Scripture. In Galatians 5, verse 22, it says this, that the fruit of the Spirit Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, faithfulness, goodness, and self-control. So there they are. There's nine fruits there, all right? But I want you to focus on the three. What are they? Love, joy, peace. Now, I don't believe in God's word that lists are shopping lists. What do I mean by that? In other words, it doesn't matter what order you get the stuff at the store, as long as it's all in the basket when you leave, right? But in God's word, there's often priorities in it. So how's it go? Love, joy, peace. What have we just read about and talked about? We've talked about joy and we've talked about love. You see, unless you experience God's kind of joy and operate in God's kind of love, you cannot have his peace. Now, here's the cool part. Both joy and love is a fruit of the Spirit. In other words, it's not something you make happen. It's not like, oh, I got to be joyful today. You know, I got to love people today. It's not like that at all. When you pray, here's how you pray. Lord, I want to bear your fruit of joy and love in my life. So all of a sudden now, it's not you trying to make something happen, but rather it's you letting something happen. This is a big difference. Really, it's giving God permission to let joy and love flow out of your life. Now, here, here's the benefit of that. Peace. That, that's how it works. I, I don't get it. I don't fully understand it. But as you operate in his joy, the joy of your salvation. In fact, uh, David, King David said this, restore to me the joy of my salvation. Listen, you could have the worst day on planet earth, but you know what you can joy in? That you've got a place called heaven that you get to go to when this mess is all over. All right, so regardless of what's going on, you, you, you're going to end well. It's a good deal. You know what I'm saying? And so sometimes we need to, if we're in our lowest, the lowest, is to remind ourselves of the joy of our salvation. The day that Jesus said, come on here, you're mine. And he wrapped his arms around us and he now loves us. That's awesome, isn't it? Amen. So love, joy, and then peace. Okay, so what else? And one more thing that he tells us in the scriptures. Okay, so here it is. John 16, verses 12 to 15. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you onto all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority. For whatever he hears, he will speak. He will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said, he will take of mine and declare it to you. So look at the bottom there. All things that the Father... That the Father has are mine. Therefore, I I said, he will take of mine and declare it to you. So here's the thing. We don't know all things. Wouldn't it be nice to know all things? Wouldn't we have peace if we knew exactly what's going to happen today and tomorrow and the next day and next year? You know, in our finances, our relationships. Because then if we saw that there was trouble coming, we could make a change, right, and fix it. You know, in other words, if we knew all things, we probably wouldn't have the anxiety we have now. But here's the thing. The things that we need to know, the Holy Spirit will tell us. But let me say this. You've got to ask Him. You've got to take some time to talk to Him. You've got to interact with Him. You, you, you can't just think that He's just going to, like, uh, you know, you're doing your life and think He's just going to tap you on the shoulder and say, oh, I just want to talk to you. Listen, you've got to go and tap Him on the shoulder. Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened unto you. That's what the Word of God says. Uh, Matthew 7, 7. And it's so important for us as believers to be pursuing the voice of God in our lives. You want peace in your life? Hear the voice of Jesus. That's really what it comes down to. Now, <laughs> in the midst of this, we're going to go back. I, I missed one scripture verse, and they're probably at the back all freaked out. He missed one. I didn't miss it. We're going back, okay? We're going back. John 15, look, look at what it says here. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. 
If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know him who sent me. So just have a look at this for a minute. Persecution is part of your Christian walk. Now, I know there's been teaching over the years in, in, in Christendom about if you're in God's perfect will, there's this like yellow brick road, everything's smooth, it's all going to be perfect. Can I tell you that's a lie? In fact, if your life is that smooth, you're probably not being obedient to Jesus. I'm just saying. Because when you're going upstream, like a fish going upstream, the tide is pushing against you. The current of the stream is pushing against you. And that's literally you and I as we're swimming against the current of this world, then we're going to have tribulation, we're going to have persecution. It is a part of the package of being a believer. But what I love is the Lord's always with you. And so are we able to, it says in verse 21, all these things they will do to you for my name's sake because they don't know him. Here's the thing, they don't know him, but you do. And there's going to be times where in your Christian walk where there's going to be challenges and people are going to you know, come against you. And what are you going to do? Are you going to curl up into a little fetal position and say, oh, I can't believe this. Jesus, you're letting this happen to me. Or are we going to stand up and say, this is part of the package. Jesus, I thank you. You're with me during this trial, during this tribulation. And everything's going to be just fine. And it will be. In fact, I have, in my life, sometimes when I haven't heard the voice of God, but the enemy's coming against me, I'm like, I know I'm going the right direction. Yeah. That sounds a little weird, maybe, but there are times where I know because the enemy is doing what he's doing, I'm like, God, I know something's just around the corner. I know something's going to happen, and I'm just going to keep my eyes on you. Yeah. And so I use it as a barometer. When persecution's happening, that means God is about ready to move. Because Satan knows, and he's trying to stop you from preparing yourself for what God's got for you. So don't see persecution as necessarily a big negative. I see it as a signpost that God is about to do something. And so again, God does what? Works all things for good for those who love him, called according to his purpose. So I encourage you to be in that place of understanding him, that He's got all good things for you, even in the midst of persecution. Okay, so here's what I want to do. We talked about a lot of things. Now, for you guys that have like logical minds, if I asked you right now, well, what did he talk about? You might be able to pull a couple things from here and there. How many people want like that screenshot on the screen where they can actually see a couple of points say, these are the three things that he talked about? How many people would like that? Can I give you that? All right, so let me give you that as, as we, we finish out this morning. Okay, so what... Things did Jesus tell us so that we could have his peace? So here's the first one. For God's peace, we must allow the fruit of love and joy into our lives first. So there it is, all right? The fruit. In other words, you've got to let it happen. Psalms 1 talks about this, that we're like, the righteous are like a tree planted by the river whose roots go deep and they bear fruit in its season. Well, I love that scripture because it opens up this whole fact that you and I as fruit trees, we have a source that we can draw from and it's the Spirit of God. The river often, especially in the Old Testament, is referring to the river of God, the presence of Jesus, the Spirit of God. And so you and I, we can draw on that, that no matter what storms are happening, what droughts are happening, no matter what's happening out there, we're drawing our energy, our, our sustenance from deep within. And we have that ability to bear fruit, bear especially the fruit of joy and love. And what happens after that? What do we get then? Peace. That's right. Okay. So here's the next one. Understand that persecution is a part of our Christian journey. Now listen, I don't like this. Does anybody like to be persecuted? Let's just take a survey here. No, nobody likes this, but it's a reality, right? And so we just need to be aware of it. And so when it happens, to just cling closer to Jesus, he'll help you through the other side. And often, again, like I said, it can be a signpost to God just on the, the cusp of doing something great. See, when persecution happens, when the enemy comes against you, here's what he wants you to do, is to turn around and go back. That's what he wants you to do, to go around, turn around and go back in your faith, to retreat. But here's the thing, that's a time when you stand taller and you say, no, I am going to keep pushing forward. And I'll tell you something, if you're willing to do that and get, get over the hump, so to speak, then there's good things on the other side, I promise you, amen? Okay, so that's first one, allow the fruit of love and joy in our lives first. Understand that persecution is a part of our journey. And then here's, I like the way I worded it. This is my wording here, okay? Here's the third one. Okay, the things we don't know 
but need to know, the Holy Spirit will tell us, all right? And, and that's a reality. We don't know all things, but the things that we need to know, if we will consult with the Lord, He will let us know, and we can operate and live in the peace that He has for us. That inner oneness, not only with ourselves, so there's no conflict in here, but oneness with Him, so there's no conflict in that direction as well. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Let's stand together. You know, peace is elusive. Now, I mentioned this last week just in passing at the very end when we received communion together. I'm going to say it again because not all of you were here as well as I think the Lord, I just believe He wants me to say this. For there to be peace in a war, you got two groups of people or two individuals fighting, unless one of them dies completely, there has to be what for the war to stop? Surrender. Now the thing is, some of you have been fighting a war on the inside of your lives for years. Fighting a war with your past, with some of the baggage in the past. Fighting a war maybe in, in the area of relationships and things that are going on right now. Just, just fighting and there's strife and, and, and you just have no peace. Whether your eyes are open, there's no peace. Your eyes are closed, there's no peace. You're just struggling right now. I have one word for you. And it's a very simple word. Surrender. Give it to Jesus. And I'm not saying give up. I'm not saying give in. I'm just saying surrender whatever you're not at peace with to Him. The Word says this, cast your cares upon the Lord for He cares for you. Listen, if you care about it, if it's affecting your life, let me tell you something. He is concerned about it on your behalf. But He cannot do anything unless you surrender it to Him, unless you bring it, in a sense, to the spiritual altar in your life and say, Lord, I surrender this to you. So just with every head bowed, just for a moment. You know, I'm not going to ask you to come forward. I'm not, I'm not, not here to do that. But just to acknowledge to the Lord by putting your hand up. Is there anyone here? In fact, I know there are. So for those that are here, let me word it that way. And as I was talking about that, circumstances, situations, or people's faces came to mind that, that you're at war with, you don't have peace with, just slip your hand up into the air. See those hands just raised everywhere. Amen. God bless you. You put your hands down. Lord, right now, you saw those hands raised all through the sanctuary. And as I was talking near, near the end, and, and it resonated in their hearts that, that they're not having peace because of these things that are going on, these people or circumstances or things going on. Lord, I pray for each individual right now. I thank you, Lord God. I thank you that your joy of our salvation is to be a platform. Lord, that knowing your kind of love, that we can love others is the next step, and then peace comes in. So, Lord, right now, in Jesus' name, I pray that your hand just be upon those that raise their hand. That, Lord, that this be a, a week of surrender to you. In fact, I just hear the Lord saying that we need to just uh, pray together about this. So let's uh, just repeat after me. Lord Jesus, I surrender right now those things that are hindering me from peace on the inside. And ultimately, peace with you. I surrender so I can receive your peace. In Jesus' name, amen. So, Father, right now, just bless your people as they go forth. Lord, I pray right now in Jesus' name that they would be empowered, that when persecution, tribulation comes, that they won't shrink back. They'll push forward to the other side, seeing your glorious victory as they push through. So bless them today as they walk in your peace, the peace of God that passes all understanding. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you this morning.